So here we go. He's not omniscient, omnipresent. How does he attack? How does he attack? So we've got to know our enemy, know what his nature is, but also know how he attacks. And you can find a lot of names in the Bible are very significant. When you think of the names of Christ or the names of people, well, the names of Satan, each one of the names of Satan gives us insight into how he acts and how he behaves. So here are some of the main ones. He's the accuser. He's the accuser. In Revelations 12, 10, we saw this verse earlier. It says, uh, therefore, uh, actually, it's that verse is wrong because it comes a little bit earlier. It's actually, oh, it is 10. I wasn't reading it right. 12, 10. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accusers of our brothers have been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. So he's an accuser. What does he, what does he want to do? He wants to, have you ever been beaten down by accusations? He's going to want to make us feel guilty. In fact, in, uh, there's a passage in the Old Testament where Zechariah, the high priest, is standing in the presence of God, and Satan's at his right hand, and he's accusing him. So if Satan is willing to accuse us in the presence of God, he's not afraid of doing that. He'll accuse us anywhere. He'll accuse you in the middle of one of your sermons. He'll accuse you when you're preparing to serve God. He, if he can beat you down with guilt, and the thing is that actually the things he accuses us of often are correct. We are sinners. We are not perfect. But he, he just wants to beat us down with those accusations. He wants to accuse us so that we, um, we somehow will stop following God. The roaring lion, 1 Peter 5, 8. And I quoted this earlier. It says, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, for a long time, I didn't understand this passage until I asked someone, because I haven't lived near lions, I asked someone who lives in Africa to explain this to me. I said, well, how does this work? And they said, well, normally when a lion is hunting, it doesn't roar. Because obviously, if you hear a roaring lion, you're going to run. Their, their paws are padded and they walk very quietly because they want to surprise their prey. But he says, one situation, a lion will roar. And that's when they're hunting together in a group. And one lion will be here and he'll roar. And the rest of the lions are waiting over here in the bushes. The animal hears the lion roaring and runs and runs directly into the rest of the waiting lions. And I said, the only other time they roar is after they've actually caught a beast. But they don't normally roar when they're hunting. He says, when they do, the, the greatest danger is in the direction that you run. And this is how Satan works. He wants to make us afraid. He roars. He wants to make us afraid. And we turn and we run. We close our mouths and we don't share the gospel. We stop doing something significant for the Lord. We back off. We get quiet. We run and we, and we hide, even in spiritual warfare. And actually, the greatest danger is in the direction that we're running, because we're running towards passivity, we're running towards doubt, we're running towards a lack of faith. And if you notice the armor of God, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, is, is all meant for direct frontal warfare. It doesn't work very well when you're running. How do you do the breastplate? How do you use your shield when you're running the opposite direction? Uh, wow, we don't, we want to not, not uh, run away when he when he comes against us. One time, my brother, who I already told you a little bit about, but he was going to pray for someone who was, who was really being attacked in the spiritual world. And he was walking down the street with another elder from his church. And they were walking along, they were talking in Slovenian. And a, a man was going up the other side of, of the street and kind of mumbling as he walked. And then all of a sudden, he looked up and saw them and he walked right across, stood right in front of them and says, turn back, go home this is dangerous. And then he turned back and just started mumbling, going the other direction. Well, man, that's a little scary when he said that, by, by the way, in English, perfect English, even though they were talking Slovenian. Uh, wow. When, when my son was uh, crying in the night, that was scary. You, you want to stop, you want to run. That's how Satan works. He's an angel of light. And as an angel of light, he pretends to be good, attractive, and beautiful. I remember when I was in college, I'd wake up on Sunday morning 
get ready to go to church and I'd go in the bathroom that was in the dorm where we were. And, and one time I was getting ready for church and I heard this, this moaning and I walked over to one of the stalls and opened it. And one of my friends was, was curled around the toilet. He was hugging the toilet and he'd been there most of the night. He'd gotten very drunk and just kind of collapsed in front of the toilet. And I said to him, Mike, wow, uh, how was the party? And he said, oh, it was amazing. It was so much fun. And I looked at him and here he is uh, throwing up, covered with vomit. And yet from his perspective, this is a beautiful thing. And, and that's the way Satan likes to operate. He wants to paint everything, make it look beautiful. But if we turn the lights on, we'd find that actually it, uh, it's fake. It's not very beautiful. He wants to paint it as, as such. He's a thief. John 10, 1, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you might have life. Now, what do thieves steal? Well, they always steal things that are precious to us and precious to God. They wouldn't steal something that wasn't precious. So Satan's trying to steal precious things like, like our sexuality. He wants to pretend that sex was something that he made up. And he wants to steal it and, and have Christian relationships devoid of it, and then say that it's over here in the world. He wants to steal relationships. He wants to steal love. He wants to steal family. He wants to steal joy. He wants to steal confidence. He wants to steal your abilities so that you're not able to use them. Thieves always will. They're not trying to steal your trash. They're trying to steal the things that are, that are precious to you. Now, he's also the father of lies. You remember in the garden, this is what he did. He told lots of lies and his lies were actually half truths. They weren't total lies. They were partially true. And Satan will always be working to deceive us and those around us with these half lies because then we start going in a direction that seems to be right and actually is leading us astray. Deceives us into believing lies. He's a murderer. He's a murderer. He's always trying to take life. So you'll notice that people who spend much time with the enemy if you've had people in your church or people who've led to the Lord, who've come under the influence of the enemy, you'll see it in their eyes. Their eyes will become dead. Their, their skin will become pale. You'll just see the life uh, seeping out of them. He's, he's actually trying to kill us. Um, he's, he's trying to take our lives. Uh, when I remember one time I met with a, um, a lady who was actually a judge she and her husband had both come to faith in Christ. And she said, could we meet together? I'm experiencing something very strange. She said, when I'm in the kitchen, I, uh, I'm overcome with a desire to take one of the knives and stab my kids. She had young kids. She said, this is crazy. Why, why, do, why do I wanna kill my kids? She says, I had to put all the knives away because I didn't know if I would, if I would hurt them. And, and actually, as, uh, as we worked into this and prayed into it, we found some strongholds that had given the enemy quite a bit of control in our life. And when those strongholds are removed, that murderous influence also disappeared. And, um, and here it is, the, the God of this age who, uh, who's going to blind the minds of unbelievers, blind the minds of unbelievers. I had a friend who was deeply under the impact of the enemy. He said whenever he'd go to church, and they would sing praise songs he, he couldn't hear. There'd be a buzzing in his ear. When someone would share the gospel, he, he would feel just like he wanted to crawl out of his skin. He had to get, get away. And that was Satan's work to try to blind his eyes and keep him uh, from knowing the truth. So he's going to do that. He's going to operate in these kinds of ways. Well, why is victory always possible? Satan is still God's servant and must have permission from God for every move he makes. God has absolute sovereignty in his universe. Now you see this in Job that, uh, and this is going to be an interesting theological question, but before Satan could attack Job, he had to get permission from God. Now that didn't mean that his actions were controlled by God, but God did draw the boundaries of what he could do. You remember the first round he said, you can impact his family, but you can't touch him. And and Satan came back and said, hey, I want to touch him. And God continued to draw a line, but Satan couldn't take one step out of it without permission. So he's not free. He's in boundaries that God has created. Uh, Luke 22, uh, 31 also, also talks about this. Matthew 4.1. It's interesting. Matthew 4.1 says, 
Um, Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's interesting. The spirit led him to a place and the devil tempted him. But you can see that the whole interchange is still under God, God's sovereign control. And Martin Luther said, the, the devil is God's devil. And he doesn't want to still serve him. He's actually in rebellion against him. But God in his sovereignty still maps the boundaries of Satan's work. So we don't have to be afraid that this universe is out of control. And in some way, by the way, we're going to talk about this towards the end, God uses the devils still to accomplish his purposes, which is just crazy, but he does. Uh, God will not allow us to be tested beyond what we can bear. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that um, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tested beyond what you're able. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, that you're, you're in testing and it's heavy, it's hard, just can't bear it. And then there comes a, a spot where it releases, where all of a sudden th there's release. And you, at that spot, you really can't bear it any longer. Uh, I believe that, that God is watching what we can actually bear and he won't let it go over the boundaries, which means that if you're under significant attack, you can actually maybe take it as a compliment because uh, God is convinced that you there is a way of escape and that you can endure it. And in Christ, the victory has already been won. Uh, Satan is a defeated foe. You can, you can see from those verses, if you go to them, that, uh, that all authority has been subjected to Christ that uh, first, first John 3, 8, just want to take a look at this real quick. First John 3, 8. It says, uh, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's so cool. The reason the Son of God appeared is to destroy the works of the devil. And all powers and authority have been put under Jesus's feet. But we need to know that victory is not the removal of problems, temptations, or pressures, but victory in the midst of that. So you, you can't assume that, um, that it's just going to disappear. The fight's going to be there till the end. The, the point is that we remain faithful in it, like Jesus did under temptation, where Satan tempted him and tempted him again. And, and he fought against sin to the place of even shedding blood, but he was victorious. So the, the fight will continue, but what's important is that you are victorious in the midst of it. And um, in, uh, in 1 John 5, it says, everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is, is the son of God? By the way, this, this whole sense of victory is possible and that we can stand against the enemy should be a great encouragement to you. should be a great encouragement to me. Remember I told you about my son and his waking up in the night, seeing things under the bed and, uh, and waking up in fear. And this went on for several weeks. And uh, we, my wife and I would, would alternate back and forth. She'd get up and comfort him. And then I would get up and comfort him. And uh, finally, one night at about two o'clock again, we heard, yelling from the bedroom and I turned over and said Connie uh, I think it's your turn because I'd been up the last time and she said no I've already been up and you didn't wake up it's your turn and I laid there uh, and all of a sudden I thought I wonder if there really is a spiritual force in his room and I wonder if we are under spiritual attack and that actually was an encouraging thought to me because I know what to do if we're under spiritual attack I know that we have the victory and I know that I'm commanded to resist the devil and that the promise of scripture is that he'll flee from us. And I also knew that that might mean I didn't even have to get out of bed. So I said, uh, Connie, I think this is spiritual battle. And then I out loud and with authority said, if there are any evil forces attacking my son right now, I command you in the name of Jesus, the power of his blood, the victory that he won over you, I command you to cease and leave him alone. And you see, what I was doing was, was sometimes just in spiritual warfare, we just pray to God, which we need to. But the pattern you see in scripture is actually we oppose the enemy. We direct it out towards those evil forces in the authority of Christ. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
And uh, when, I, when I said that from our bed, it was like someone had taken a light switch and just turned it off. He was yelling and screaming and then just, it just stopped. And we all were able to go to bed. And the next morning we went into the room and uh, prayed through that room. Just said, if Satan has any claims on this place that we renounce them. We prayed about the things that had happened in that room before. We, um, we claimed the power of God and his protection over that place. And my son slept peacefully for the next months. Uh, you know, it actually, if we know it's spiritual warfare, we should be encouraged to run into the battle rather than run away because of the victory that we know is in Christ Jesus. Okay, we're going to actually, get, yeah, I'm sure you're going, oh, I got some questions right now. So we're going to get to some of those questions. Those are, those are coming. But um, let me just make sure I know where we're at. We're still on track. Yeah, we are. Okay, good. Great. So um, we also need to know about three levels of spiritual warfare. So this is going to be important. Remember, we found out what Satan's like, where he came from. We looked at his names. I don't know if you can remember any of them. He's a murderer. He's a thief. Angel of light. Accuser of the brethren. Roaring lion. Um, thief. Do you remember those? Okay. Uh, we also said that it's not even warfare. It's asymmetric. God's always stronger. He has the victory. Satan even has to get his permission for the area that he works in. But there are also three levels of spiritual warfare. And this is important to understand. The first level is temptation and harassment. So if you could just picture, you see this on your screen, picture the circle that's kind of your, um, your area of protection. Well, Satan's always trying to come in and attack that through temptation or through harassment. In a minute, we're going to talk about the difference between temptation and harassment. His goal is to break through and either get you to sin or not obey. Sin would be directly disobeying the commands of God. Not obey would be you don't share, share Christ with your neighbor. You quit as the pastor of your church. You don't engage in spiritual warfare. He, he wants to stop you to create a hole in your level of spiritual protection. And so that uh, you sin, but always there's repentance, which then gives you protection again. And uh, this, is, this is this level one spiritual warfare. By the way, you're going to be in level one spiritual warfare really the rest of your life because, uh, well, it started with perfect people in Genesis, right? There was nothing wrong with them. And yet Satan engaged them with, there's not much harassment there, but there was a lot of temptation. Uh, in Luke 4, 1 through 13, there you have the temptation of Christ, where the Spirit leads Jesus into the desert to be tempted. And uh, he tempts him when he's weak and when he's hungry. He tempts him with very, very sophisticated way, even using God's scriptures. And then, like I mentioned earlier, at the end of this passage, it says Satan left him for an opportune time, which means that that temptation will come back. It's, it's not the only time that's going to happen. So you're going to be tempted from the enemy. And then there's this other area of, our, of harassment. So I think one of the questions that even came up earlier was, you know, how do I know when things go wrong, if it's the enemy or, or just circumstances? Well, sometimes we don't know for sure, but we do know that the enemy can harass us. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he says, um, he says, let me get here, 12, 7. He says, I wanted to come to you many times. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if I got the, got the right verse. It may be that this is in, um, I don't know if I got the right reference. Is it, one, is it 1 Corinthians? Let's see if it's 1 Corinthians. Anyways, he says, I wanted to come to you many times, but was prevented. Uh, and... Uh, no, actually, that's not right. I need to look at my notes here. It says there was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. So this thorn in the flesh, this thing that was, um, it was actually a messenger of Satan. Now, God was using it, but he says this is a messenger of Satan. And then you have the examples in Job. This is really crazy because Satan goes to heaven, gets permission to tempt and harass Job. And then when he comes down, what, what happens in this passage in, in Job 1 and 2 you see one verse on your screen, but 
what happens is, first of all, first of all, what happens is there's a group of Chaldeans who attack some of his kids and, and a group of Sabians who attack some others. And then fire falls from heaven and consumes some of his flocks. And then a wind comes up and knocks down a bunch of tents. And so on all of those, we're, we're initiated by Satan. So we know that Satan can initiate people rising up against you, the Sabians and the Chaldeans. We know that Satan can actually influence uh, physical uh, uh, physical conditions. He brought fire and a wind. And then a little bit later on, when Satan complains, hey, you haven't given me access to Job, God says, okay, you can, you can do that to Job. And all of a sudden, Job breaks out and boils and is scraping himself with pottery with these boils. So we see Satan can actually bring sickness. He can bring sickness. He can bring warfare. He can influence, um, he can influence uh, uh, conditions. We see those things in Job. And actually, in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, this is a verse I was thinking about a little bit earlier. Uh, he said, I wanted to come you, to you many times, but was actually prevented by Satan. 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, 2, 18. He says, I was, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, that Satan hindered us, so Satan stopped them. Now, obviously, one of the questions is, 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 is Satan behind every storm that comes? Is Satan behind every sickness that comes? Is, is Satan behind every opposition from people? Obviously not. There's a, a lot of windstorms that aren't from him, but he does have the ability to bring these things on us. And so uh, particularly when, you'll find this, you'll, your car will be working perfectly. And then uh, you have a very important ministry assignment and um, your engine blows right at that moment or uh, right, right before I got ready to go today, I had my PowerPoint presentation and, and somehow my, this, my PowerPoint program slow, uh, shut down by itself and I lost three hours of work from last night. And so I had to do that again this morning. Now, I can't say 100% was that from Satan, but I do know that Satan does harass God's servants. And particularly the harassment is designed to get us off track, to get us distracted, and to keep us from following him. So if you're in situations like that, one of the things is stay, keep going. You won't necessarily stop all the harassment, but if you stay obedient, and you stay focused on God and don't get sidetracked, you've won. You've won the victory because that's, that's his, what, he's, what he's trying to do is he's trying to keep you from following and obeying God. So he's going to harass you. Uh, back to Sun Tzu in the Art of War, he said, when the men are well-trained, rested, properly fed, clothed, and equipped, if their spirits are roused, they will fight victoriously or vigorously. However, physical... Our material conditions have blunted their spirit. If there is any imbalance in the relationship between command and troops, or for any reason they have lost motivation, they'll be defeated. Conversely, the commanding general must manipulate the situation so as to avoid the enemy when their spirits are strong, such as early in the day, and exploit any opportunity presented by their weariness, attacking when they no longer have any inclination to fly, fight such as when they're about to return to camp. Uh, the fundamental tactical principle for attacks is go forth where they do not expect it, attack where they're not prepared. That's Sun Tzu again, the art of war. Basically what he's saying is try to get your enemy weak and distracted and attack that. And so Satan and his harassment is going to try to get you dist distracted. Um, he's going to sometimes He'll use sickness, problems, and, um, and again, what he wants is he wants to keep you from obeying God, and uh, you may still get sick. Jesus was still tempted. He was still harassed. What's important is that you stay on track and you keep obeying. Satan's goal to keep us from obeying God or to lead us into sin.